Hi, it's Heather from Thick It Works. Today, I'm going to show you how I made this set of spectral medieval monks. These faceless figures just ooze atmosphere and will add a creepy vibe to just about any display. We begin the process with corrugated cardboard cut into strips that are one and a half inches wide by five inches long. I wanted to create a group of six monks, so I have six of these corrugated cardboard strips all ready to go. And then with a piece of cut off corrugated cardboard, I'll be creating supports to help the figures stand straight. These supports take the form of tiny right angle triangles. You'll want at least 12 of them. For the base of each figure, I'm turning to mid-weight chipboard. This is much more rigid and durable than the corrugated cardboard, so it's a good choice for the base of each of our figures. I chose to use a hot glue gun for most of this build. It speeds things up, it's inexpensive, and it's a lot of fun to work with too. If you're bothered by the little strings of hot glue that tend to accumulate, those can be easily melted away using a heat tool at the end of the process. Attach the upright panels to the bases once the triangular supports have been glued in place. Hot glue is perfect for this as well. It'll create a sturdy bond and of course it bonds almost instantly, speeding everything up. I like to work production style, so I'm setting up each of these armatures by gluing the initial components in place and then when that phase has been completed, going back and adding additional supports on the other side of each of the upright panels. These will stand straight and true for many years. To create an armature for the characteristic bowed head of each monk, you can ball up just a wad of regular aluminum foil, making sure to leave a bit of a neck with a flat area at the bottom that can be hot glued to the top of your upright. You don't need any sculpting skill at all for this process. Just create a sort of head shape with a neck that is bent forward and glue that in place. To make the next step easier, I just tacked each of these in place with a dollop of hot glue before stepping outside to apply a primer coat. I'm using Rust-Oleum two time in flat black to spray the front of the little heads and the front of the panels and the bases. No need to add any spray paint on the back that will be completely covered. At this point, I want to add organic elements to the front of each of the bases. So I'm painting on a substantial layer of PVA glue and then adding bits of moss directly into the adhesive. Next, I'm using sprinkles of dried out used coffee grounds to simulate soil, and then fixing everything in place with a watered down layer of PVA. A few spritzes of isopropyl alcohol help the adhesive to penetrate all the way through the organic material and create a good sturdy bond. Repeat this process for each of the figures and then allow them to dry for a few hours before moving on to the next step. We'll be creating flowing drapery that covers a good deal of this ground cover, but that tiny glimpse of moss and soil that's going to help integrate the figures into whatever scene you choose to display them in. Now that the armatures and the bases have been created, it's time to begin working on the flowing robes. For this, I'm using cheap black cardstock and saturating it with water. Next, 
create pleats along the length of the sheet of paper, just using finger pressure, and then squish it all together to create a series of delicious wrinkles. Unfold the paper and tear it into long, jagged strips. It's just fine if the strips aren't perfectly even. The more ragged, the more sinister. Apply a heavy layer of PVA glue to the shoulders and back of the figure and along the front edges of the shoulder area as well. Tear one of your strips so that it's slightly longer than the standing figure so that you'll have an inch or two of excess material to create intricate folds trailing along behind your figure. Repeat the same draping process on the front of the figure. Gluing it securely in place at the shoulder area and allowing the damp paper to drape into interesting folds at the hemline. Next, to create a little more bulk at the upper body and to simulate sleeves, take a strip about six inches long and fold it and glue it as you see being demonstrated here. Then tear it in half so that you have two of these folded pieces Drape one of these pieces around each shoulder. This will act as an indication of the figure's arms and sleeves. At this point, it's a good idea to clamp everything in place and allow the layers of dampened paper to dry before continuing with the process. The next step is to create that characteristic monk's hood. So apply a thick layer of PVA glue to the figure's head and upper shoulders. And taking a dampened rectangle of black cardstock, center it across the top of the head. I know this looks really silly. But then begin to press it into place, gathering it tightly at the base and back of the neck especially. Clamp this in place and allow those tight gathers to dry. Once those gathers have been clamped in place, you can continue to shape the front of the hood or the cowl at this point, pressing down along the forehead and then adding interesting draped effects as the fabric falls towards the figure's chest. After a few minutes, you can remove the clamps and then reinforce all those creases with a tool. Continue this process for each of the figures. Next, it's time to add that characteristic capelet. For this, I'm just tearing more strips of dampened cardstock and draping them around the shoulders of the figure, covering up the base of the hood that we just created, and adding lots of intricate gathers right around the neck area. This caped effect will be more interesting if you allow it to billow outward slightly at the back and the sides. Clamp it in place and allow it to dry. To create the impression of greater bulk and to add more gestural interest, add billowing strips of cardstock down the front of each character, creating lots of interesting folds. This next figure looks incredibly skinny and very unrealistic, and we can address that by adding more layers of dampened cardstock billowing outward toward the front of the figure. Add a heavy layer of black gesso to the face and to any areas where there may be accumulated PVA that doesn't look quite natural. While your completed figures are drying, you can create a set of medieval shields using medium weight chipboard 
and scissors. Create a series of fantasy heraldry designs using tiny snippets of chipboard glued into interesting patterns on the front of each shield. Here, I'm using a simple repeated chevron pattern. Once the pieces have dried, it's easy enough to snip away the excess. Add a generous layer of PVA glue over the top of your completed designs that will lock everything into place. I think my favorite design has to be this simple checkerboard pattern. It's a little fussy to put together, but I love the final effect. It's really cool. I'll be giving all of the shields a base coat of this sort of darkened down yellow tone. It takes a couple of coats to get decent coverage with drying in between. Next, I'm reaching for a bright crimson and I'll be using this to coat the background of each of the shields. It's okay if you get a little of the red paint on the upper surfaces. We'll be adding final coats of the yellow paint as well. Make sure to dry thoroughly between each coat to enhance the intensity of the pigment. Now it's time for the first weathering pass. A tiny piece of sea sponge gripped by a pair of tweezers is being used to pounce a cool gray around the areas of the shields that might have received the most battle damage. Use a light touch and concentrate on the edges of the shields where they would have received the most handling. Another weathering pass, this time with a pure white. Again, use a light touch going over the same areas to which you applied the gray paint. Why is weathering so much fun? This has got to be my favorite part of the whole project. Tone everything down with a layer of do-it-yourself coffee stain and add black craft paint or gesso to the back and edges of each shield. Next, let's use a dry brushing technique to bring out all those intricate folds that you created in the figure's drapery. Here I'm using graduated layers of grays, beginning with a dark charcoal and working up to an almost pure white to capture all of that detail. Now it's time to equip each of our spectral monks with his medieval battle shield. A little bit of hot glue is all that it takes. I chose to place each shield under the figure's left arm. I just like the way it looks there, dangling underneath the edge of the little capelet. The subtle color that we added to the bases and to each of the shields really helps distinguish the spectral nature of each of our hooded monks. They're lurking in the churchyard, but are they protectors or something more sinister? Will they helpfully usher the dear departed to her final resting place? Or are they here to keep her from rising? Either way, they definitely add an aura of mystery. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Until next time, bye.